This time we look at five motorcycles to get you to work. For most people, the motorcycle is simply something that's used for pleasure. They don't usually use it in their day-to-day -day commuting. But for some of us, the motorcycle is a major part of their commute. It's the vehicle we use to get to work. So here are five of the very best get you to work motorcycles. The BSA Bantam. Like so many commuter bikes of the early post-war period, the BSA Bantam is closely based on the DKW RT125, although in this case BSA actually mirrored the design, so it switched the gear change to the other side, in the normal British style. The RT was also produced by Harley Davidson, Yamaha and a whole bunch of other people, including a number of Russian companies. It was very much the machine that got people to work, and the Bantam was BSA's particular version. The engine was a unit construction, single cylinder, two stroke, in the case of the BSA, it ran a Y-Pack Magneto. The original D1 model was a 125, very closely based on the RT. It ran rigid rear suspension and only kicked out around 4.5 horsepower, for a top speed somewhere in the mid 40s. Plunge suspension was added after a couple of years and this did enhance the ride somewhat. In 1953, the D3 Major arrived to run alongside the 125. This used a 150cc engine and had a little bit more go but it still wasn't exactly fast and furious. The D5 Super would arrive then in 1958, and on this machine the engine was taken out further to 175 cc's, which gave a bit more performance, although at this point it was still running a 3-speed gearbox. 1959 would see the D7 Super. This would run a whopping 7 horsepower from those 175 cc's, again though still 3-speed gearbox. This machine would run until 1966, when it was replaced by the D10, with a very credible 10 horsepower on tap, more than double the original 125, and of course much better performance. The D10 pushed top speed up around nearly 60 miles an hour, and the range was added to by a sports model, which had chrome mudguards and a bit of a fly screen, and by the Bushman. This was an off-road model designed for specific markets. As well as adding a bit of bling, these sports models also boasted 4-speed gearboxes for the first time, Oh, the luxury. 1967 would see the end of the D10, and in 68 we got the D14 4, which as the name suggests had a 4 speed gearbox. The machine actually made around 13 horsepower. Legend has it that BSA, after releasing a few bikes as a D13, thought that people would feel that it was unlucky, so the name was changed to D14. I have to say the D14 is a rapid piece of kit. We owned one of these and it would hit 65 miles an hour. The big problem with the D14 but it wasn't particularly reliable. 1970 would see the introduction of the B175. This was an improved version of the D14 and can be distinguished by its central plug, otherwise it's very similar to the D14. And here is the crux of the problem. The machine had not really evolved for many years and was now hopelessly outdated. An improved version of the machine was developed but never put into production and a plan by another firm to use the Bantam as a trials machine was scrapped because someone at BSA had inexplicably thrown away all the machine tools and casts and dies to make the Bantam motor. BSA Bantam was phased out in 1971 and was by that point the best selling British motorcycle of all time, despite those German origins of course. Now it's not known for certain exactly how many BSA Bantams were produced. It's thought that the figure is somewhere between a quarter and half a million units. Either way, it's an impressive number. the NSU quickly. The Quickly was a moped manufactured by NSU, a German manufacturer, between 1953 and 1968. In total, more than a million NSU Quicklys were actually produced. A number of variants were produced of the Quickly. The first was the N. This used a single cylinder two-stroke motor, pedals to start and two gears. 
The engine produced about 1.4 PS for a top speed of around 30 miles an hour on a good day. Production of the N model ran between 1953 and 1962 and over half a million of this particular version was actually made. The Model S arrived in 55. This was essentially the same bike but with more Valance mudguards or fenders if you're American. Next came the L model or luxury model. This was produced between 56 and 61 and again was essentially the same machine but had rear suspension and had leg shields and more advanced weather protection. 1957 would see the Cavallino. This stylish little number was still basically the same machine underneath, same engine, although it did run different size wheels, but it was a very nicely styled little variant. Next came the Quickly T or Tram Quickly, which means dream quickly. This had a 1.7 PS engine, courtesy of a 6.8 to 1 compression ratio, and ran the same frame as the Cavallino. And this high compression, slightly more powerful motor would be fitted to all NSU Quicklys that were subsequently constructed. These included the N models, the S and the F models. These all varied slightly with larger tanks, dual seats and various other changes, but essentially the machine was not really developed after 1963. So the NSU quickly entered the mid-60s with a design that was essentially stagnating. But of course this was now in the face of the Japanese onslaught, which was coming full force into Europe at that point, including bikes like the Honda Cub, which was far more advanced and more modern than the Quickly, although owed more than a nod in its basic styling and design to the Quickly. But the bike would continue into the late 60s with very few changes, until finally being discontinued in 1968. The Honda Super Cub. If any small bike can be described as legendary, then it has to be the Super Cub, because the Super Cub is the machine that truly democratised motorcycling, and indeed transport. But the idea of a 50cc runaround really started in Honda's head when Sakira Honda and Takei Fujisawa visited Europe and toured Germany in the 1950s. They saw mopeds at the NSU quickly and realised there was a gap in the market for a four-stroke machine which would be more reliable and more fuel efficient. And indeed the German influence can be seen in the machine's unusual leading link forks and that pressed steel frame, all very common in Germany at that time. They designed the bike with leg shields just like on a scooter, but unlike a scooter they gave it larger wheels, following the pattern set by the NSU quickly. They also used a centrifugal clutch. This was not the first to be used on a motorcycle, in fact Jauer had done that previously, so ultimately Honda would have to pay a royalty to Jauer for every machine sold. Of course there was that urban myth about the non-clutch design being desirable because of noodle sellers in Japan. Is that actually true? It might well be actually. The first Super Cub model, the C100, with its familiar pressed steel frame arrived in 1958. This used at that time an overhead valve engine with a cast iron barrel and cylinder head which made a claim 4.5 horsepower and was said to be enough to push the bike to around 43 miles an hour. Selling a trend that was followed in all the Super Cub engines, the C100's engine was very low compression. This made the bike easy to start and of course also made it extremely robust. Early versions of course ran a 6 volt system for cheapness and had a magneto for ignition. The first variant came in 1960, this was the Super Cub line or C102. This had an electric start and a 12 volt battery coil ignition system replacing the magneto but was otherwise identical to the earlier model. 1963 would see an enlarged engine of 86.7 cc's in the C200 model. 63 incidentally was also the year that Honda began their You See the Nicest People on the Honda campaign in the United States and did a great deal to help push the Honda as a sensible form of transport in the eyes of the American public. 1965 would see the first overhead cam engine. This was the 63 cc C65 which made around 6.5 horsepower. In 1966 Honda replaced the C100 with the all new C50. Although a broadly similar design, it now featured an overhead cam engine just like the C65, which made around 4.8 horsepower, which remained in production very little changed until the 1980s. The same year also saw the arrival of the CM90. At last, the C90, perhaps the most famous variant of the machine, took its bow. Now, in the forms of the C50, the C70, and the C90, the little Honda would remain pretty much unchanged all throughout the 1970s. However, in 1982, CDI ignition arrived, 
for the American variants to meet emission rules. And in 84, the bikes got a full restyle, with that square headlamp appearing, replacing the old, more traditional round style. With sales of the bike diminishing in Europe and America in the mid-80s, Honda focused the machine onto the Malaysian market, where they were rapidly gaining a cult status. Here in 1986, they introduced the C100 with an enlarged 100cc engine. In the 1990s, Honda would undertake an update program of the machine, introducing 100cc, 110 and 125cc versions of the Cub, some with disc brakes. In 2018, Honda celebrated the 60th anniversary of Super Cub production. By that point, they had already sold over 100 million machines, passing that figure in October 2017. Honda would at last take the opportunity in their anniversary year to introduce an all-new version of the machine, the 125, into the USA, Europe and Australia. And although it looks very similar to the earlier machines, it is substantially redesigned, with a completely different frame, a revised fuel-injected motor, ABS, LED lights and keyless ignition. Whether this new model will prove as popular as its predecessors is very hard to say. The fact is, the Honda Cub is the best-selling vehicle of all time, and it's been in production since before I was born. And to be honest, I'd really like to see the machine carry on and be equally successful. But don't tell her I told you this, but it's also Mrs. Biker Dude's favourite small bike in the world. Pook Maxi. Pooch or Pook, if you're going to pronounce it correctly, which I admit I never do, was an Austrian motorcycle manufacturer that produced the Maxi throughout the 1970s and into the 1980s. It was well known for its reliability and ease of maintenance, and as you can see it is a very simple design machine. It's a large wheeled step through scooter. Most models are fitted with pedals in the usual moped fashion, although some later machines had a kickstarter too. The machine used Pook's 49.9cc two-stroke engine. This can be seen on a number of other machines also. And was quick enough to push the machine along at just over 30 miles an hour in standard form. Although in some markets the machine was limited to 20 miles an hour and 25 miles an hour. The first model was the E50 and this features a single speed only transmission. This is replaced in the ZA50 by a twin speed transmission. Both machines featuring a centrifugal clutch. The Maxi S arrived first, and this of course featured the E50 one speed engine transmission system. This was soon joined by a model with a twin seat, and then by a Maxi Lux, which had a high torque head and mud flaps. Alongside these machines, they introduced the Maxi N. This had a rigid frame, no speedometer, and was really built down to a price. The midpoint of the 70s would see the arrival of the Mark II with its ZA50 two speed engine and transmission. This would be joined by the Maxi Nostalgia in 1976, which featured that black and gold paint job, which is now extremely popular. After 76, we see the Newport range. Initially, this was little more than some stylistic changes to the earlier models. But the range would see the introduction of an oil injection system, so at last you didn't have to go for the ritual pre-mixing oil with your petrol every time you stopped at the gas station. The Maxi was very much a machine of its time. Its 120 mpg potential made it extremely popular during the fuel crisis of the 1970s. But by the 1980s, the Stalin looked somewhat old hat. And with the commuter market for motorcycles in Europe shrinking very quickly, Pooch decided to discontinue the machine in the mid-80s. Pooch Maxi S51 Simpson was a manufacturing company based in Germany. It produced firearms, automobiles, bicycles and motorcycles. The Jewish Simpson family were forced to flee Germany during the 1930s. The factory was then taken over by the Third Reich and it was at this point that the first motorcycle appeared, a 98cc two-stroke. Post-war under communist control, the factory produced a range of 250cc overhead valve four-stroke machines. But after producing some 209,000 of these machines, the company was forced to switch to moped production. In 1955, the company introduced the SR1. This was a 48cc moped, producing around 1.5 horsepower. This machine was then developed into various forms throughout the 50s and 60s. 
including fairly conventional style mopeds, off-roaders and of course scooters. In 1975 they introduced the S50. This had a revised shorter stroke engine which produced 3.6 horsepower. This version was built until 1980 when it was succeeded by the S51 and its S70 stable mate. Changes with the S51 included that longer stroke motor which produced around 3.7 horsepower. The S70 which had arrived in 83 produced around 5.6 horsepower. These models would continue virtually unchanged until 1990 when the change of the political climate would see the end of the S51. But the Simpson has gained cult status since it was deleted and remains a popular classic moped long after the original company faded from view in 2003. What collections of videos would you like to see? Have you got a machine that you particularly like us to focus on or like to see us test run? Please comment below. I do hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, don't forget to like and subscribe and of course, thank you very much for watching.